everyone, this is Liz Brassoff from Thrust Flight. I'm one of the chief flight instructors here and I'm also a first officer at a regional airline. Have you ever wondered what to do if your engine fails while you're in flight? Today we're going to talk a little bit about what to do if that occurs and the best actions to take in that scenario. So a common uh, mnemonic or memory aid that instructors use to teach their students for handling an engine failure in flight is ABCD, or we'll say, go back to your ABCs. The reason why we want to use a mnemonic or a memory aid is because if your engine fails in flight, there might not be time to pull out a checklist and think about, what should I be doing now? It's a pretty immediate situation, especially if it happened at low altitude. So these can be applied in any different scenario in flight, just after takeoff, in cruise flight, just prior to landing, but you're gonna have to adapt them a little bit to how much time you have in handling the situation. So let's go through them. I told you it's A, B, C, D. So A is airspeed. The first thing I wanna put some attention to and prioritize when handling an engine failure in flight is what airspeed am I flying at and making a correction to get to the proper one. We wanna fly at our best glide speed so that we can maximize our time in the air and hopefully get to the best landing spot in that gliding distance. So that speed for your aircraft needs to be memorized. It's going to be marked in your manual for your aircraft and I want to make sure that I know how to change my aircraft state to get there. You'll hear a lot of stories about pilots on takeoff that when they've had an engine failure shortly after takeoff, their airspeed is actually below best glide or it's decreasing so rapidly it's going to get there because of their pitch angle that they'd actually need to lower the nose to get to best glide. So that's something we wanna be thinking about. As I take off, I might have to lower the nose to get to best glide. Whereas in cruise flight, be holding level flight to slow down to best glide in most general aviation aircraft. Or on landing, perhaps that's the same speed as your landing approach speed or really close to it. All right, the B is best place to land. So we had airspeed, now we have best place to land. So that's gonna depend on your specific scenario in flight. Is the best place to land the airport you came from? Is it an airport ahead of you? Is it a road or a field because you can't glide to an airport? So there's a lot of options there and that's what your instructors are gonna try and teach you is how to decide what's the best place for the situation I'm in. So there's a couple of tools that I wanna talk about with you. The first one is is most of the aircraft you'll be training in will be equipped with a GPS and they all modern GPS's now have a function called the nearest page where I can press a button or turn a knob right and get to a list of the nearest airports to my aircraft's current position you want to be careful these lists often include soft fields private fields and those are pretty tough to spot from the air depending on their size and so I either want to train my eye to skip past those and look for the hard fields, or I want to have some training from my instructor on how to spot a soft field as I'm approaching an area so that I can see it in the other crops of farmers fields or be able to actually identify this as my landing site before I've gone too far. Now I've glided so close to the ground, I still don't see this landing site and I've given up better options. The other thing to think about is if this is going to turn into an off field landing, what type of field would be best for that scenario? So has it rained lately? Is this field gonna be soggy? And when I touch down, it's possible my landing gear digs into the soft earth and flips us over. Or are there crops planted in this field in lines and I wanna make sure I land with them instead of against them? Uh, they're typically called furrows and they can be over a foot and a half deep. Can you imagine your airplane going over a foot and a half uh, mounds on the ground, that would be quite the ride and not something I want to experience. I'd much rather land in plane with them, even if that means I had a little bit of crosswind as I touch down. Uh, roads can be a good option depending on where you're at. Many roads have power lines that cross over them, so they'd be a bad option. I don't want to be caught in power lines on my way down and maybe I can't even see them until we're really close to the ground. Uh, other roads, no power lines in sight, would be an excellent landing spot, especially considering all the earth around it is developed. It's homes, uh, it's buildings, it's places that aren't cleared for a landing, right? Or maybe you're flying at five o'clock and it's rush hour traffic and the roads are packed with cars. Bad place to land, right? There's no place those cars are gonna be able to move to when they're already bumper to bumper on the highway full. 
Other things I would want to consider, I talked about with the rain, right? Perhaps landing on a road or other hard surface is more favorable because of the weather we've just had. Uh, one of my favorites out where we train in Dallas, it's been growing a lot, so there's a lot of construction, is when they develop new neighborhoods, they'll have the road and the cul-de-sacs um, completed before they've built any homes around it. And there's no power lines coming to it awesome place to land. I'd pick that all day over a soft surface because that's what I'm familiar with. I land on hard surface runways way more often than soft surface. So if I can do that in an emergency, I will be much more successful in completing that landing. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about choosing an airport for a landing. Perhaps you've pulled up that nearest page or you're familiar with the area and you know I can glide to this runway, but I'm going to land on the opposite runway as the rest of the traffic. Making a radio call prior to completing that landing is going to be essential to keeping you and the others safe. Um, we'd hate to have a perfect power off, glide all the way to this airport with an engine failure and then have something go wrong in the last couple seconds because of the other traffic there that didn't see us or find us. So in an engine failure scenario, it's very possible that the engine is not running, but my radios still are. And we'll talk about that communication piece as we get a little further along, but all things to think about when I'm thinking about best place to land. Um, if you've had an engine failure directly over an airport, right? That would be an awesome scenario, you think. I need to not just say, well, there's an airport, we're gonna be okay. I need to think about how to plan that traffic pattern entry and maybe I can plan it so I enter on the standard downwind side at the right altitude um, or in a much more predictable place for the other traffic operating at that airport. All right, so let's move on. We've talked about airspeed, best place to land. C is gonna be checklist. If this was a surprise engine failure to you, right? Not something you saw coming. I might be able to restart this engine or perhaps even if I saw it coming, maybe there's some actions I can take to prevent this from being an unpowered off field landing. So what we'll complete is our engine failure in flight checklist. Uh, this is one that really you can adjust depending on the time uh, in the situation you have. If it's shortly after takeoff, a lot less time before we're gonna meet the ground than if we were in cruise flight thousands of feet above the air. So that checklist might have some memory items on it. We've talked about that in other videos where it's in bold text and those are the items I need to have memorized, ready to act, right? And it'll have other items that aren't in bold where I can pull out the checklist, reference it. They're less immediate in the time they need to be completed. This checklist is going to have you check your sources of fuel. So I'm going to have checking my mixture, checking fuel pumps, checking my sources of spark. So maybe my ignition position or my magnetos. Um, it's also going to have me check sources of air because I need fuel, air, and a spark to have a light off in my engine, right? So perhaps I need to open my alternate air. Maybe I need carburetor heat on, right? There's a couple of things here that would seem common sense to check if we've had our engine fail and your checklist will guide you through the troubleshooting there that would hopefully lead towards this engine reigniting. Some aircraft might even have restart procedures where they'll have you try the ignition and turn it to the starting position to hopefully again, get the engine running so you can make it to the next airport to land at. So that's checklist. We've got um, airspeed, best place to land, checklist. And the next one is D, um, declare. So this is when we start communicating and talking to others around us to let them know what's going on. We wanna make sure that's our last priority. We need to be flying the aircraft, finding where we're headed, right? And uh, trying to take care of that situation as much as possible before even thinking about talking about other people. The most important part of what's happening is inside your aircraft before we start thinking about outside. Um, just like we talk about with your aviation priorities, right? Aviate, navigate, then communicate. That's what we're getting down to now is the D for declare. So declaring an emergency, there's a couple different steps for that. The first one is my transponder. I wanna change that to the emergency code 7700. Anybody who's monitoring the radar now knows your aircraft is in an emergency state. Um, next, we have an emergency radio frequency. That's 121.5. We can change our radio to it and make a mayday call or an emergency call on that frequency. So we need to start that call by catching everyone's attention. So we could say mayday, or you can use the term pan, 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 but you'd say either one three times. So mayday, mayday, mayday. Then you wanna tell them the standard radio communication format, right? I wanna tell them who I am, where I am, and what I need. Just like if I was calling for a taxi. So I'm gonna tell them who I am. I'm gonna tell them my approximate position, maybe even where I'm headed, right? If I'm gliding towards another airport or an off field 
and then what I need, right? So requesting emergency assistance or have passengers on board, landing off field, most people can put together that you're gonna need some help after that. And the last part of Declare is your aircraft is probably equipped with an ELT and you might have the ability to turn on or off that ELT. It should turn on on impact, but you also, in many aircraft nowadays, have a pilot activated switch where I could turn on that ELT preemptively or perhaps my landing isn't gonna have an impact hard enough to set off the ELT, but that locator beacon can still start sending out its signals so that help can find us and arrive quickly. So now that we've learned the ABCs on how to handle an engine failure, I wanna talk a little bit more about how to adjust them for the circumstance you're in. So I referenced an engine failure on takeoff being a lot different than an engine failure in cruise flight. Really what's different is not the airplane, it's not the pilot, it's the time I have to handle this situation before we'd be meeting the ground. So I still need to think about my airspeed, I still need to identify the best place to land. I probably need to do that a little bit faster if I'm close to the ground, like on takeoff or landing, than if I was in cruise flight. And checklists can really change. You might have an abbreviated memorized version of this checklist that you would check if you're on an engine failure scenario that's 2,000 feet or less above the ground versus when you're in cruise flight, perhaps you'll complete the long form checklist that's in your aircraft manual. In either case, we want to have that checklist quick access, ready to use, not buried in a book in your baggage compartment, right? But that's really some place that we can adjust how much time it takes to respond or what my actions will look like depending on the altitude or time I have. And declaring an emergency, you might completely omit that depending on where you've had your engine failure and how much time is left to handle it. If I have an engine failure on takeoff and I'm more worried about where am I putting this airplane, am I managing the airspeed and energy of the aircraft as we're coming back down, I might never get around to to declaring the emergency. We might just be landing and making sure that we can survive and walk away from this situation. Whereas if I have an engine failure in cruise flight, very likely that I'll be able to declare the emergency, ask for some assistance. Maybe they can even help point me towards a place to land. Uh, just gonna really depend there on how much altitude or time I have to handle this situation. So don't feel pressured to get to declaring the emergency. It's last in our checklist for a reason. So this is just one emergency you could encounter in flight and that you'll practice during your flight training. If you're interested in learning about more emergencies that you practice in flight training and how to handle them, watch this video we did a couple weeks ago with Walter about aircraft emergencies in flight training. And don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on our future videos.